For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted a heavenly gift and have partaken of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, impossible to, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Today we're looking at Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. And as to a, a reminder of those who have seen part 1 or who were here last week, please remember that I'm just a messenger here. What I am doing is presenting to you one of the earliest, if not the earliest, documented sermon that was ever given on this particular passage by one of the early church fathers. I'm sure that it was preached many times before this, but this is one of the earliest records that actually was preserved through history. This is a sermon that was given by John Chrysostom, who was the Archbishop of uh, an Archbishop in Constantinople back in the third century. And you will see that his take on this passage is quite different than what's taught today. And before we get into it, what I would like to do is just explain the structure of the lesson today so you know how it's going to look. First, we're going to look at Chrysostom's interpretation of this passage. And as you will see this interpretation, it, had, it was something that had become common or uh, known in his time. Towards the end, we will look at some other examples of some other church fathers who had the same view that he had. Um, and um, maybe they were right, maybe they weren't right, maybe they were wrong. I'm simply going to lay this on the table and give you a little something to think about. And you can decide for yourself which side of the fence you want to fall on. If you remember last week, we talked about how these verses that we're talking about in today's world end up as being one of the cornerstones of the debate of whether or not salvation can be lost or if the once saved, always saved doctrine is a reality. So first we're going to look at the interpretation that Chrysostom had, and then we will move on to the second part of the lesson where we look at the historic view of once saved, always saved. We will zoom out and take a quick look at some of the other early church fathers and what they believed on this very popular doctrine of today. Last week I left you all with some homework, and that was to read Romans uh, chapter 6, verses 1-10. through 10. Let's read it together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So notice how this pass these passages are riddled with these four concepts, death, baptism, crucifixion, and resurrection. Let's look at it again. This is the entire passage. We who have died to sin, we were both baptized into Christ and were baptized into his death, buried with him through baptism, and raised from the dead to live in newness of life. And then Paul somewhat re repeats the cycle. He says the old man was crucified. We are united in his death. We are partakers of the resurrection. We die with Christ, and shall we, so we shall live with him. And finally, Christ will never die again. For death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died once for all. Just look at all of these statements and how they're connected with death and baptism and crucifixion and resurrection. Now, I know it's a little bit redundant, but I want to look at it one more time. <clears throat> because if you want to understand what Chrysostom is, is pointing at here in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, you're going to want to have these fresh in your mind. This time, though, as we read it, I want us to make one minor change. Let's look at this word knowing. It has possible renderings which include uh, to be aware, or to perceive, or even I know. I would like to add one more option to this list. Not that I believe that I have the authority to define words, but it's the exact same concept, just the way that we say it today. And this phrase is, with the understanding. Let me give you an example of this. 
When I was 17 years old, I had a suspended driver's license due to getting what was referred to as a super speeder speeding ticket. Back in those days, if you were under 21 years old and you got a speeding ticket going more than 27 miles over the speed limit, automatic suspension of your license. So I had a suspended driver's license. And I knew that if I was driving on that license and I got pulled over, I knew 100% I was going to jail. Out of stupidity, I decided late one night, driving down the internet to see how fast my Nissan 300ZX could actually go. It was a long downhill slope down the interstate. I found out that that sucker could go up to 117 miles an hour. And it could have gone faster if it hadn't been for that cop that I passed by the side of the road. On came the blue lights. I was pulled over knowing that I was going to jail. That is to say, I pulled over with the understanding that I was on my way to jail. So when we see this word knowing, let us replace it with the word with the understanding. Substituting this phrase for me, it helped me grasp the connection that Chrysostom is making a little bit better. And it might do that for some of you as well. If it doesn't, just throw it out. So back to Romans 6, verse 4, or verse 6. With the understanding that our old man was crucified with him. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism and to death. So what was the purpose of this crucify, being crucified and buried with him? The purpose was that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who dies has been freed from sin. Verse 8. Now if we die with Christ, we believe, or if we die with Christ, meaning we were crucified with him and buried with him in baptism, then we, be, we believe also that we shall live with him. And what does this mean? Better yet, what does this look like to live with him? Paul just told us. He said that just as Christ was raised from the dead, even also we should walk in newness of life. So this is what dying with him and raising with him looks like. We are to walk in newness of life. Now notice the intimacy that we share with this experience with our Lord. He was crucified. We were crucified. He died. We died. He was buried. We were buried. He rose. We rose. With the understanding, with the understanding that he would never die again. And these, are, these verses 9 and 10, they spell this out very clearly for us. It says, with the understanding that Christ, having been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Now, this passage as a whole is describing one of the great mysteries of Christianity. That, that is what happens in our baptism. And verse 9 and 10 tells us that we are to understand this baptism in the light of knowing, or with the understanding that death no longer has dominion over him, that he will never die again, that he has conquered death. And that brings us to the end of our homework recap. Next, let's look at Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3, which lead up to 4 through 6, which is our passage for today. Last week, we talked about the elementary principles, or the ABCs of Christianity. This foundation was referred to in chapter 5 as milk, and we discussed that this was not in any way to diminish these core principles. To call them milk was more so a rebuke on the audience for all those who were forever listening but never learning. Chrysostom had said, Do not think, however, that the values of the faith are diminished by being called elementary. For when Paul says, For everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, it is not the elementary principles that he is calling milk. He is saying that to still be doubting these things after so much teaching is a sign of a feeble mind. Last week we discussed how we discussed how to measure or to weigh a man's life in order to determine if that man still needs to be on milk or not. This is measured by whether or not he lives a right life, whether or not he has purged himself from his sin, or if he is persisting in living in evil deeds. This is not to be mistaken to be living a perfect or a sinless life by any stretch of the imagination. Let me explain this, and let me explain this a bit. I wish that Christians at large were better at distinguishing between sins of ignorance and willful, blatant sin. I also wish that the idea that all sins are the same was not so deeply embedded into the teachings of today. I don't think that that is very safe. All sin is the same in the sense that sin is sin, but the idea that all sins are exactly equal can be dangerous in some people's lives. So all sin is not the same. Let's imagine, for example, that we're at a fellowship meal and we have pizza delivered. An announcement goes out to everyone before everyone fills their plates. We have just enough pizza for everyone to get two slices. If anyone gets three slices, someone's gonna go without. So there you are at the first of the line. You get the, the cream of the crop, the prime pick. 
and you go to pick up your pizza, and the tip of the cheese at the tip of your pizza doesn't detach from the next one, and you rip off half the cheese off the next slice. If you were really preferring your brother, if you were really living a sinless life, you would put down that cheesy piece and take the one that's, that's half, with half the cheese missing. Why? Because you know that at least 98% of the people behind you would be tickled pink to get that cheesy piece, and you know less than 1%, if not 0%, none of them want the half-naked piece. Not all sin is the same. There is a difference between keeping the cheesy slice and looking at pornography. There's a difference. It's not the same. If your brother, or if it bothers your spouse that you don't put down the toilet seat and she's told you a hundred times, and you don't make it important, important enough in your life to remember, then that's sin. But there's a difference between not putting down the toilet seat versus having hatred in your heart towards your brother and delighting when you find out that he has fallen. There's a difference. Not all sin is the same. So when we say that the mark of a man that no longer needs milk is that he lives a right life and does not do evil deeds, that is, this is not to say that the man never keeps the cheesy slice or forgets to put down the toilet seat. This is to say that when the man encounters the sin that he knows will defile him, that the temptation is pounding on him, the man who no longer needs milk believes with such conviction what the Bible says is true, that he will resist that temptation all the way to the point where the devil actually flees from him. This is, how we know, or this is not to say that they have victory every time, but it is to say that the victory is there for the majority of the time. And this is what Chrysostom meant when he said, but if anyone has faith, yet does evil, this shows that he actually has doubts concerning the faith itself. That if a man truly believed the foundation Christian doctrines of repentance and baptism and the resurrection and judgment, if he truly believed them without a doubt, he wouldn't succumb to, to the evil that actually defiles him. And this is the mark of a man that's building on the foundation of Christ and no longer need of milk. Very quickly, let's look again at the elementary principles laid out in verses 1 through 3. As we saw at the start of this lesson, our homework was saturated with the concept of baptism. Now, as we read these elementary principles again, I want you to notice how many times they pertain to baptism or, could, or, or a connection could be made with baptism. Principle number one, repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. This is to live a pure life, one that is repentant. Not perfect, but repentant. Now, how, is this a, uh, how does this tie to baptism? In Acts 2.38... Then Peter says to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So repentance and baptism are closely related. The command to repent immediately precedes the command to be baptized. Principle number two of the doctrines of baptisms. Now this clearly has to do with baptism, but I want you to notice something that I never noticed, and I probably never would have if I didn't read Chrysostom's sermon. Notice that it does not say the doctrine of baptism, but it says the doctrine of baptisms with an S, to be it plural. Chrysostom says, not as if there were many baptisms, but only one. Why did he express it in the plural? This is a good question. We'll circle back to this in just a little bit. Let's look at the next one. Elementary principle number three, the laying on of the hands. Notice that this also has a close tie to baptism. This is referring to the laying on the hands immediately following the baptism that we see in Acts 19 which says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid their hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So first there's a repentance and then baptism. Then immediately after that, the laying on the hands. Elementary principle number four, the resurrection of the dead. Now at face value, this has nothing to do with baptism, but look at this. And of the resurrection of the dead, for this is effected in baptism and is attained in the confession. All right, so now let's take a look, quick look at a few passages in Scripture that clearly point to the fact that there is a connection between baptism and the resurrection of the dead. So first we have Romans 6 here, and I think this is where Chrysostom was getting his ideas from. In verse 4 it says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism and to death, so there's the baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even though we also should walk in newness of life, for if, if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, then certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. So there's a clear a connection there between being united in, in his death, if we are united together in the likeness of his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism and to death. Then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
The next one is 1 Peter 3, verses 21. It says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there we have the resurrection. Here we see baptism giving us a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of our Lord. Then in Colossians 2.12, we see here, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Again, we see a a connection here between uh, baptism and the resurrection. Now this last one here, it's a little bit more difficult to see. To my understanding, Paul in this passage, he is actually uh, rebuking a group of people who they do not believe in the resurrection. But this particular group of people, for some reason or another, they were actually baptizing people on behalf of other people. Say, for example, that maybe you had a relative that passed away before Jesus was born, and then now Jesus has come and died and and been, been resurrected into heaven. And now you are baptizing, say, your father on behalf of your dead grandfather. Uh, So here Paul is addressing them, and he says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why are they then being baptized from the dead? So he's saying, if you do not even believe in the resurrection, what what in the world is the point of baptizing someone on behalf of somebody else, if you don't even believe in the resurrection. So clearly, again, we see that there is a connection between baptism and the resurrection. I had always looked at this passage with an internal application. But as you can see, Chrysostom also saw an earthly application to this connected with baptism. That the resurrection of the dead is affected when we raise from the dead in baptism. And finally, elementary principle number five, eternal judgment. Now there is no connection with baptism here. But to this, Chrysostom asked the following question. But why does he say this, and of eternal judgment? Because it was likely that having already believed that they would either be shaken from their faith or they would live evil and slothful lives. Therefore, Paul brings up eternal judgment to encourage them to remain vigilant. Remain vigilant? Why would they need to remain vigilant? Because it is not open for them to think that after the cleansing of baptism that they can live a sinful life a sinful life, and then expect to be washed clean of their sins a second time by being baptized again. You are deceived, Paul said, in supposing such things. So where is he going with this? Chrysostom has pointed out that four of the five elementary principles are connected in some way with baptism. He then says the fifth uh, elementary principle of eternal judgment was added in an effort to make the born-again believer to remain vigilant. And then he says that the reason for this vigilant is that if they believe that they can stain themselves again with sin after their baptism, that they can just wash it away with another baptism. So where's he going with this? Let's keep going. This brings us to verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have partaken of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, impossible to, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. So let's go back to verse 4 and let's start clawing our way through this. For it is impossible. Let's start here, Chrysostom says. Notice he used the word impossible. He did not say it is not seemly, or it is not expedient, or it is not lawful. No, he said it is impossible. For it is impossible for those who were enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gifts. So this phrase, and tasted the heavenly gifts. So often we talk about the gifts of God in the plural, but notice here that it says, and have tasted the heavenly gift. What is this? According to Chrysostom, this is referring to tasting of the forgiveness of sins, tasting, having remission of sin. That the heavenly gift is the forgiveness of sin. And we'll see this in a quote in just a little bit. But first, let's look back again at Acts 2.38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of sins. There it is. So having tasted the heavenly gift is referring to the remission of sins. So we see that Chrysostom once again sees a connection in our passage today with baptism. Tasting of heavenly gift is the tasting of the remission of sin, which comes immediately at baptism. Now before we look back at our text, let's first look at the end of this verse. Repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts ties these things together. Repentance, baptism, remission of sins, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now look at the very next thing that comes in today's text, back to verse 4. And having tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. 
So there's the connection there. And this is to become indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And as we just read in Acts, this happens in our baptism. And so we see another connection with baptism. Next verse, verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God. What does this mean? Paul is speaking here of the teachings or doctrines of God. And finally, the powers of the age to come. And the powers of the world to come. What power is he speaking of? He is speaking either of the works of miracles or the conviction of the Spirit. And to illustrate this connection of being a conviction of the Spirit, uh, he points us to 2 Corinthians, where it says, Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So this is where we're at so far. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift or the remissions of sin and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit if they fall away. Now this term, if they fall away, this refers to a man who has chosen to abandon his repentance. Which is, if you think about it, that's what started this whole thing, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and be baptized. So the term falling away refers to a man that has chosen to abandon his repentance and return to his sin. This is a man who has returned to his vomit. Tertullian says this about the man who repents unto salvation and then falls away. He says, a man commits no small sin against the Lord when he by repentance renounces the Lord's rival, the devil, then again raises him by his own return to the devil. He is clearly here speaking of someone who is saved, someone who is born again. This man he speaks of has both repent, repented and he has renounced Satan. A man commits no small sin against the Lord when after by repentance renounced the Lord's rival, the devil, he again raised him by his own return to the devil. For such a person becomes a basis of exaltation to the devil. For he who has known both God and Satan seems to have made a comparison. Therefore, he who has begun to make satisfaction to the Lord will by repenting of his repentance now make satisfaction to the devil. He will therefore be more hateful to God in proportion as he is more acceptable to God's rival. So Tertullian did not use these specific words, you can lose your salvation, but it's not hard to see that it's there. He says that this man has chosen his side. He has chosen his allegiance. He renounced Satan. He turned his back on Satan and he became a Christian. He repented unto salvation. This man can still, if he chooses, turn away from his repentance. He can repent of his repentance and begin to make satisfaction to the devil. And when he does this, he, he becomes a basis of exaltation for the devil. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So what's happening in this passage? What in the world does a man who has fallen away and then who has renewed to repentance, how in the world is that crucifying Jesus again for themselves? And how would this be putting Him to an open shame? What does this even mean? Does this mean that a man can no longer repent of his sins? Or that God will no longer accept this person's repentance? When Paul says renewed them unto repentance, he meant by repentance. What then? Is repentance done away with? Chrysostom asked the same question. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you trying to say that repentance is done away with? God forbid, no. Not repentance. Well, if it's not talking about the end of repentance, then what is it talking about? What is being done away with is the idea of being renewed again by baptism. Once again, Chrysostom brings this idea of talking about a second baptism. For he did not say impossible to be renewed unto repentance and then stop there, but added impossible to bring him to repentance by crucifying Christ again. He says, listen, it's impossible for one who has fallen away to be renewed again to repentance, but you can't stop reading right there in the middle of the sentence. Paul's very next words are that they crucified to themselves the Son of God, putting him to an open shame. And this brings us, ties us into our homework. Let's read it again. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that we were buried with him through baptism into death. We have been united together in the likeness of his death. With the understanding that Christ has been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Now, notice carefully how Chrysostom is using this passage in, he, in Romans 
to show how this passage in Hebrews is in no way means that a man who falls away cannot return to God. Instead, he argues that the entire purpose of this passage in Hebrews is to make the clear case that the Christian that has fallen away cannot be made right with God again by being rebaptized. He continues by quoting Romans 6 himself. He says, You were made conform to the likeness of his death. You were buried with, with him in baptism. In baptism, you were crucified with him, and he dies no more. He died to sin once for all. He then that gets baptized a second time crucifies him again and puts him to open shame. This pointing to verse 6. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For if death shall no longer have dominion over him, if by his resurrection he has become superior to death, if by death he wrestled with death and overcame it, and then he's crucified again, then all these things become a fairy tale and a mockery. If the scripture teaches that he is superior to death, he wrestled with it, he overcame it, and it no longer has dominion over him, and then if we crucify him again, everything that we just said is just made up. It's a fairy tale. It's a mockery. Romans 6.6 6 says that in baptism you were crucified with him. Our old man is crucified with him. He then that baptizes a second time crucifies him a second time, making a mockery of him and putting him to open shame. Back to verse 6. To renew them again to repentance since they crucify again. Now, the, peop, the translators of Chrysostom's sermon, they translated this crucify afresh. What does this mean, crucify afresh? It means crucifying again. For as Christ died on the cross, so do we in baptism. Not that we die to the flesh, but to sin. Behold, two deaths. He died to the flesh, and in our case, the old man died and was buried in baptism, and the new man rose, made conformable to the likeness of his death. If therefore it is necessary to be baptized a second time, then it is necessary that Christ should die again. For baptism is nothing more than the putting to death of the baptized and him raising again. Since they crucify again for themselves. What does this term mean? For themselves. And when Paul chose the words crucify afresh unto themselves, he chose his words well. For he that is rebaptized acts as if he had forgotten the grace bestowed on him in his first baptism. And then after being baptized the first time, he conducted his own life carelessly, staining it again with sin. This person acts in every way as if there was another baptism, but there isn't. Therefore, it behooves us to take heed and to make ourselves safe. So real quickly, let's regroup. This is where we're at. The sections on the screen that are in white are the ones that we've covered. The sections in yellow are the, yellow are the ones we have not yet. Let's dig into them. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. We touched on this a little bit ago. What is this? What is having tasted the heavenly gift? It is to have tasted the remission of sin. For this is of God alone to give, and the grace is a grace once for all. But if we were always to be saved by grace, by baptism after baptism, then we would never be good. Would we cease from sinning if we knew it was possible again to have our sins washed away? For my part, I think not. You were counted worthy, Paul says, of so great a forgiveness. You were sitting in darkness. You were at enmity with God. You were at open war against Him. You were alienated. You were hated of God. You were lost. Then you have been suddenly enlightened. You have tasted the heavenly gift. You have been counted worthy of the Spirit and of the heavenly gift as adoption of sons and the kingdom of heaven and all other good things and unspeakable mysteries. And yet you choose to not even become a better man. You choose to restrain yourself with sin. For you indeed are worthy of eternal damnation. Yet you obtain salvation and honor as if you have accomplished some great thing. How could you be rebaptized? There is no second baptism. There is not indeed. And if there is, then there is also a third and a fourth. For the previous one continually disannuls the next, and then, and then that one by another, and so on without end. And finally, let's look at this. And tasted, he says, the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. That is to live as angels and to have no need of earthly things. To know that baptism is the means of our introduction to the enjoyment of the worlds to come. This may we learn through the Spirit and enter into the sacred recesses. He even sees this part of the verse through the lens of baptism. 
pointing out that baptism is our way or our means by which we are introduced into the heavenly kingdoms or into the world to come. So now let's look at Chrysostom's position from a, from a bird's eye view. On the screen are all six of the verses. The ones highlighted are in blue are the sections where at least he made some sort of connection with baptism. Repentance from dead works, repent and be baptized. The doctrine of baptisms, notice that it's plural. The laying on of hands e immediately after baptism. The resurrection of the dead, raised to newness of life after being crucified with him and buried with him in baptism. Tasting of the heavenly gift or the remission of sins received in baptism. Partaking of the Holy Spirit received in baptism. The power of the age to come. Baptism is our entrance into the kingdom of the ages to come. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame, to, the bapti to be baptized again is to crucify him again. And in doing so, you make a mockery and a fable of the, what the Lord has accomplished. This being said, I was wondering if Chrysostom was alone in his ideas, or if there were other early church fathers who may be written about this passage. It turn, turns out that Ambrose, who also lived at the same time as Chrysostom, he wrote about this specific passage as well. If you go any further back and look in all of the anti nicene writings, there's practically nothing on this passage. We just don't have much. By the 4th century, this particular teaching was circulating. <clears throat> Let's see what Ambrose had. The passage quoted by the heretics against repentance is explained in two ways. The first being that Hebrews 4.4 refers to the impossibility of being baptized again. The second explains that it was what is impossible for man is possible with God. It is evident that the writer is speaking of baptism from the very words he used. For he stated that it is impossible, impossible for those who were fallen to be renewed again to repentance in the same way as he was renewed in baptism. This too is plain, that in him who is baptized, the Son of God is crucified. For our flesh could not be done away with sin unless it were crucified in Jesus Christ. And then, and then it was written that all who were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And further on, if we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was fastened with him to the cross. And to the Colossians, he said, buried with him by baptism, wherein you rose again with him, which was written to intend that we would believe that he was crucified in us, that our sins may be purged through him, that he who alone can forgive sins May nail, may nail to the cross the charges which were against us. So then, that which he says in the, in the epistle to the Hebrews, that it is impossible for those who have fallen to be renewed unto repentance, crucifying, excuse me, crucifying again the Son of God and putting Him to open shame, must be considered as having reference to baptism. Wherein we crucify the Son of God in ourselves, that the world may be by Him crucified for us, but Christ was crucified once, and he died for sin once. And so there is but one, not several, baptisms. Since they crucify, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So there's a few reasons why I may have never heard this before. I think it's possible because of two relatively popular beliefs. One is that baptism is a symbol. In today's culture, baptism is mostly taught as being merely a symbol, an unnecessary symbol of a reality that has already taken place in the believer's life. With this predominant teaching, it makes perfect sense that we don't hear about people lining up to wash their sins away a second time. Many people don't even get in the water the first time. The second popular belief that plays into this is that salvation cannot be lost, and this is the once saved, always saved doctrine. Another popular way that this is worded is by saying that all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. In a culture where baptism is a symbol and future sins are already forgiven, there is hardly need to address the idea of people wanting to be rebaptized. It makes a lot of sense. As of yet, I have not yet seen a single hint in the early church writings of any idea that future sins that are committed after baptism are in any way pre-forgiven by some conversion experience. I see no indication that any early, early church father believed in the once saved, always saved doctrine. In just a moment, we will see the exact opposite of this. And I know that this is super unpopular to the world, but don't shoot me, I'm just a messenger. 
I'm just presenting to you what they thought. And you can read these things for yourselves. They are public domain. With that being said, it makes sense that the concept of rebaptism may have been something or was something that may have been needed to be addressed in Chrysostom's time. Think about it. If, there, if it is true that no, that no Christian of those days believed that their future sins were forgiven, I could see how many people would have been lined up to get rebaptized. Who knows, maybe this was happening in Chrysostom's time. Maybe this, maybe this is why he interpreted these passages this way. Maybe he was dealing with this and it caused him to react, seeing this whole passage as being about rebaptism. Or maybe it's exactly what God meant in this passage. I don't know. I'm not convinced that we can know 100% certain on this one. I can see Chrysostom's argument and I can say, yeah, maybe that, that makes sense. I can also listen to other explanations, more modern explanations, views of this, and I can also look at those and say, yeah, that, that might make sense too. But just because we maybe can't know exactly what Hebrews 6, 4, 6, 4 through 6 is saying, we can dig much deeper into this idea of whether or not salvation can be lost by looking at a lot of other stuff that we do have and that we do know. Let's let Chris Awesome answer this one last question, and then, we'll, the, then we will dig into the historic view of once saved, always saved. If future sins are not forgiven and rebaptism is forbidden, then what if a man sins after his baptism? Is he permanently lost? Is there no more repentance? The answer is absolutely not. What then, you say, is there no repentance? There is repentance. There is, but there is no second baptism. But repentance there is, and it has great force. It is able to set a man free from the burden of sin and can establish safety in him who is in danger, even if he has gone to the very depths of wickedness. And this is evident in many places in Scripture. For it says, does not he that falls rise again? Or he that turns away, does he not turn back to God? It is possible, if we will, that Christ should be formed in us again. For hear what Paul says, my little children of whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Only let us lay hold on repentance. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a historic view of this doctrine. And we're going to look at some scriptures and we're also going to look at some early uh, church quotes. <clears throat> but first, let me frame the conversation. Let me plant an idea in your head. Follow me on this logic. If future sins are not forgiven, then one saved, always saved goes out the window. One saved, always saved is, is saved is dependent on the idea or the belief that when you become born again, all of your sins that you will ever commit in the future are paid for. They are forgiven. If sins are not forgiven in the future, then there is no one saved, always saved. These, this next set of quotes we're going to be reading are all about repentance. And the majority of them were written by leaders and bishops who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century. Listen to these quotes and you tell me. If it sounds like the church of the first few centuries believed in any way that future sins are forgiven. Clement of Alexandria. Those who fall into sin after baptism are those who are subject to discipline. For the deeds done before baptism are remitted in baptism. However, those committed after baptism are purged through discipline. I used to believe that all my future sins were forgiven. That's where I believe that for the majority of my life. So I know that many people out there, when they hear these quotes, they're going, they're going to sound a, a whole bunch like works-based salvation like a whole bunch of men trying to be good enough to get into heaven. That's what it's going to sound like. But the early church did believe that salvation is a free gift and that it is not obtained by works. That was clearly their belief. But they also believed that Christ came to save you from your sins. That after your baptism, after your, you are freely given this gift of the forgiveness of sins, that to abandon your repentance is to then refuse to be saved from your sin. That's like trying to be saved without trying to be saved or trying to accept a free gift without accepting the free gift. So try to keep these things in mind as we read these. Methodius, repentance erases every sin when there is no delay after the fall of the soul. It erases every sin when the disease of sin is not allowed to go on for an extended time. For then evil will not have the power to leave its mark on us. Here Methodius is describing a situation when a man falls and then quickly repents. 
that the sin is quickly erased, he says, because the disease of sin is not allowed to remain on us. So encourage us when we do fall, quickly repent. But what about this? What about when a Christian enters into a season of sin? Where he returns to his vomit and he begins to make a practice of sin again. How is this dealt with in God's eyes? Is it the same as when a man falls and repents quickly? Listen to how Hermas describes a situation like this. These are the ones whom have now heard my commandments and repented with their whole hearts. Now notice three things that are coming up next. Three things that God is looking for in this man's repentance. When the Lord saw that his repentance was good and pure and that he was able to remain in it, he ordered their former sins to be blotted out. Through my life, I was always given the impression that after my conversion, when I sinned, the very moment that I said, oh God, forgive me, that I was instantly forgiven. Even if I had indulged in that same sin for decade after decade, and even if I already had plans to sin that way tomorrow, the, the utterance of my mouth meant that it happened in my mind. Is that the truth? That's what I was led to believe. Go back to the second century and you see a totally different story. Here we have the Lord watching this man who has turned away from him and has begun to practice sin again. And when he finally turns back to the Lord, the Lord is waiting and watching, watching his repentance, waiting for it to be found good and pure and to see that he's able to actually remain in it. Then he orders his former sins to be blotted out. Next, let's turn to Clement. Now notice how he expresses the understanding that God might depart from us when we become unrepentant and then return to us once we repent. And listen to what he means repentance is. He says, True repentance means to no longer be bound in the same sin for which he denounced death against himself. Rather, it is to eradicate them completely from the soul. For on their extirpation, God takes up his abode in you again. This word expirtation, it means to destroy completely, to wipe out, to pull up from the roots, to cut out, by surgery. For once the sin has been totally destroyed, God takes up His abode in you again. He goes further. For if we sin willfully after having received the knowledge of truth, there remains no sacrifice for sin. Here quoting Hebrews 10. But continual and successive repentings of sin does not differ at all from the case of the man who never believed. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so whoever believes in Him will, will not perish. Believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. We hear this all the time. But Clement here says that sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting is no different than the man who never even believed. Clement again. He then, who from among the Gentiles and from the old life have come to faith, has obtained forgiveness but once. But he who sins after this should fear, even though he, can, even though he may obtain pardon because of repentance. Did you hear that? This isn't all doom and gloom. It's not like you just mess up once, once and you're kicked out of the heaven of God. Listen, what the apostles taught before they died had the early church convinced across the board that you were washed clean in your baptism and then from then forward, pardon for your future sins was granted through repentance. But he who has sinned after this should fear, even though he may obtain pardon because of his repentance, for he is as one who is no longer washed of the forgiveness of sins. This next one, Tertullian, this is one of my favorites. Repentance is the price for which the Lord has determined to award pardon. So after baptism, pardon isn't free. There's a price. He says, repentance is the price for which the Lord has determined to award pardon. Sellers first examine the coin for which they make their bargains to see if it is cut, scraped, or counterfeit. I've given this illustration before, but it's worth repeating. I want you to imagine you go into a gas station late at night and you walk up to the, to the counter and you buy a, a candy bar and a Coke and you pull out your wallet and you realize the only thing you have to pay with is a $100 bill. What does that cashier do? He gets out a marker, scribbles on it, he looks for the watermark, he's look for that little strip in there. What's he doing? He's trying to test it to see if it's counterfeit. Sellers first examine the coin for which they make their bargains to see if they're cut, scraped, or counterfeit. Likewise, we believe that the Lord, when about to grant us eternal life, He first tests our repentance. God forgives 
God gives forgiveness of past sins. However, as to future sins, each one procures this for himself. He does this by repenting, again, by condemning the past deeds and by begging the Father to blot them out. For only the Father is the one who is able to undo what has been done. Isn't that a beautiful picture? The Father actually has the power to undo what you did. Like what you did can be undone, and He alone has that power. Question. Does it sound to you like the early church leaders of the first few centuries, after the apostles died, believed in any way that future sins are somehow forgiven? Not at all. And this is just looking at it from the view of repentance. There's so much more. Let's look at some scripture. The Lord is with you while you are with Him. This is 2 Chronicles. If you seek Him, you will be found, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. The, Ezekiel, the righteousness of the righteous man had, uh, shall not deliver him in the day of his transgressions. In Matthew, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. In Luke, Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Second Timothy, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Hebrews, If we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. 2 Peter, for if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world, so they got away from the pollutions of the world, and then are again entangled into them and overcome by them, the latter end is worse for them than in the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have to come to know it and then to turn back from turn away from the holy commandments delivered to them. And we see this again in Matthew 25, where Christ separates the sheep from the goats. And then we can go to John 8, where Jesus tells them that only they are only His disciples if they abide in His Word. And then in John 15, where Jesus says, if you keep My commands, you will abide in My love. Clearly implying that if you don't keep His commands, you will not abide in His love. Or in Romans 2, where God says that I will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who doing good seek immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, for them there will be indignation and wrath. These early church leaders, they didn't just make this stuff up. It's all through the Scripture. And I know that this is laborious, but for those who may be on the fence in these things, allow me to build even a greater case that these ideas of future sins being forgiven, it did not exist in the beginning. It is not a part of the faith handed down to the apostles. The world returns to its sin, and so it is destined to fire. It is the same with the man who, after baptism, renews his sin. It is not to those who are on the outside that he said these things, but to us, lest we should be cast from the kingdom of God by doing such things. Tertullian. No one is a Christian, but he who perseveres even to the end. Ignatius, those who do not obey him are disinherited by him. They cease to be his sons. Barnabas, therefore, brethren, we ought to take careful inquiry concerning our salvation. If we do not, the wicked one will make an entrance by deceit and may hurl us forth from life. The whole past time of your faith will profit you nothing unless now in this wicked time we will withstand the coming source of danger. Take heed, lest we fall asleep in our sins. For if we die in our sins, the wicked prince will acquire power over us and will thrust us away from the kingdom of the Lord. It is terrifying to think that if you die in your sins, that the wicked one, the prince of this world, can acquire power over you and thrust you from the kingdom. And you should pay attention to to this all the more, my brothers, when you reflect on the fact that even after such great signs and wonders had been performed in Israel, they were still abandoned. Let us beware lest anyone be found. Let us beware lest we be found to be, as it is written, the many who were called, but not the few who were chosen. And then Clement of Rome, who was a leader of the Roman church in the first century, Clement was so close to the time of Jesus, he may have been an infant when he was, when he was crucified. He said this, Since all things are seen and heard by God, let us fear and forsake those wicked works that proceed from our evil de- desires. By doing that, by forsaking our evil works, through God's mercy, we may, pro- we may be protected from the judgment to come. For where can any of us flee from, the, from His mighty hand? Let us then practice righteousness so that we may be saved unto the end. 
I'm almost done. Listen to these terrifying words from Hermas. For the Lord has sworn by His glory and in regards to His elect, so He's talking to us here, that if any one of them sin after a certain day which has been fixed, he will not be saved. For the repentance of the righteous has limits. But to the unbeliever, repentance will be possible even to the last day. So in God's mercy, the unbeliever can repent all the way up to the end. For the Lord has sworn by His Son that those who deny their Lord have abandoned their life in despair. And where does Hermas get this? From Matthew. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before the Father in heaven. Conclusion. We may never know for sure on this side of heaven exactly what Hebrews 6, 4-6 through 6 is about. But we do not need to know that in order to know that future sins are not forgiven. It's, that is not a part of the historic faith. So what do we do with this? If you're watching this and these ideas are new to you, and you maybe attend a church where, these, where they teach something different, what in the world are you supposed to do with this? This is what you do. You take this message and you go to your church. Call a meeting with your pastor. Meet, call a meeting with your brothers. Tell them there's something important that you need to talk to them about. That something has been presented to you that you need to figure out what you're going to do with in your life. All these writings from the leaders of the church in the first and second century, they're out there for everyone. They are public domain. Put these teaching before, teachings before your brother and ask them, what are we going to do with this? Do we stick our heads in our sand or, or do, don't stick your head in the sand? Talk to your brothers and find out what you're going to do. Are you going to dismiss them? Are you going to explain them away? Just reject them? Or are you going to consider possibly changing what you believe about these things? And then finally, if you begin to look in these things with your brothers and you're struggling with them and you have questions, then find us. We're here in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. We do our best to monitor our YouTube, uh, our comments in our YouTube. We will do everything that we can to help you through these very difficult and very important questions of the faith. So that's all I have to share today. Sorry that I ran us late. Yes, sir, David. Yeah, appreciate it so much, man. You put a lot of work into this and, and it's a deep subject. I told you earlier in the week, I wasn't quite convinced that Chrysostom's explanation was correct, but actually going through it another time today, I am convinced that that is what Paul is talking about here. I think looking at verse 1 where he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, he's talking about that as the beginning of the Christian life, where uh, you repent, which is talking about right before baptism, that, that repentance. And so... Yeah, it makes perfect sense that then he's saying we cannot go back. We can't start over again. We, we can't do this uh, initial repentance and baptism and all that. But he's not saying we can't repent. Right. You know, his words are to renew them again to repent. So we, we can't have that new birth go over again. But we can repent. So I see a, a nice balance there that the early church saw how serious it was to go on in sin after you have once been born again and forgiven. But, yeah, not that you can't ever repent, but boy, be careful. If mm -hmm. you are walking on uh, treacherous ground. The quote from Ambrose was also very interesting, and I hadn't thought about this. When he says the heretics say you can't repent, there were two groups who had broken away from the early church, and based on this passage in Hebrews, they said, you know, if you commit a serious sin after baptism, like you commit adultery, something like that, no forgiveness, that's, that's it. You're proud of the church, you can never come back in. And I'm, I'm glad the church looked at all the verses in the Bible and said, no, you can repent. But yeah, you're on, you're on you know, shaky ground, but if you truly repent, then, you know, God will, will let you back in. All right. But not if you just keep on doing it. I mean, you, you can't just live a life of adultery and, and think you can just, you know, get, go and repent all, you know, continually for the same sin and, and think God's going to always be merciful. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah, I had a <coughs> similar thought. I'm, I never heard the whole his connection with baptism. And when you mentioned it to me, I was like, I'm not sure about that. And I didn't go look at it. But one thing you said about resurrection, and you said, well, I don't know about this, but you pointed out the... Romans 6 part, but actually it's something that I've noticed for a long time in baptism. If you go through all the scriptures about baptism, like here's one in 1 Peter 3.21, there's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. 
And then he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and goes on. And then the Colossians uh, 2, 9, uh, we'll start with, buried with him in baptism, which you are also raised with him through the faith and working of God. And then the Corinthians one where they're baptizing for the dead, and he's like, well, why are you baptizing for the dead if you're not raised from the dead? I mean, it's like, so connecting the resurrection with baptism, dying with baptism, and the resurrection with baptism. And then the Romans 6, being raised with him. So I think it is a very, I mean, it's... Common theme. Yeah, like the laying on the hands. I mean, everything he said is the forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, laying on the hands, all that happens right in that time. Mm-hmm. It yeah. seems clear after listening to that that that's what it was about. Although, when I'm guessing myself. All right, me neither. Thanks for filling in those gaps there. Yes, sir. Let me enter that. Uh, it's very interesting because, you know, 40 years ago, Deborah and I were in a church that taught eternal security. You can't lose your salvation. Your sins are pre-forgiven. Uh, your future sins are pre-forgiven. And, you know, I pointed out, I remember being in a discussion with, with some of the church leaders, this very passage. I said, look what it says, you know. And their claim was, well, he's talking about someone who's never been saved. I said, what? I mean, it says, you know, once in life. And actually that, that verb there, or that word, once in life. In other passages, they translate that once for all. Like in Jude, you all know, right. faith once for all, hand it to the It's the exact same Greek word. So you're talking about someone who's not saved, but he says you, you've been once for all in life, and you've tasted the heavenly gift, you, you received the Holy Spirit. It's like, if he's not saved, who is saved? You know, right. I mean, it's like... <laughs> I just can't find that. that. That's not being honest with Scripture.